Hey guys, this is one of the most interesting topics in Excel biology, health, disease and medicine. Why we get sick and how we can cure ourselves when we do get sick. If you want to make sure you've covered everything in here and you know all these tricksy, tricksy keywords of biology, they are all in my written guide which you can download for free from my website. Health is a complicated concept. It is going to be your overall state of physical and mental well-being. This is going to be affected by a number of things. It is going to be affected by your diet, exercise, community, whether you feel lonely, whether you have friends, and in part by your genes. A pathogen is a microorganism that causes disease. For example, we can have viruses, bacteria, fungi, or protists. And these can be spread in a number of different ways. They can be spread in the air, for example, by coughing. They can be spread by touch, uh, for example, if you have bacteria on your hands or you have bacteria or virus on your hands and you touch a table and someone else then touches that same table. They can be spread through blood, uh, sexual fluids, or they can be transferred via a vector like via a mosquito. Bacteria are going to make you feel ill because they produce a lot of toxins, so they'll give you things like food poisoning. Viruses will make you feel ill because when they reproduce, they cause massive cell death. Cholera is a bacteria. It is spread generally via um, water systems. The implications are severe diarrhea, which um, is incredibly dangerous for very young and very old, so for babies. Pregnant women. And what they die of is dehydration. It may sound funny that it's diarrhea but it is deadly. Tuberculosis is a bacteria and it is spread by coughs and sneezes. It is going to lead to a cough which may be bloody fever, fatigue, um, swellings, weight loss, sweats, loss of appetite. To help combat that, the BCG vaccine um, is routinely given to babies and children. And this can be fatal. Stomach ulcers were previously thought to be the result of um, stressful living, um, eating rich food, um, having uh, too much alcohol. They were thought to be a, a lifestyle disease, um, something that overweight people who didn't do enough exercise and had very, very stressful jobs got. And this continued to be the case until Barry Marshall, quite an innocuous name there, um, Barry Marshall proved that it wasn't, and he proved that it wasn't in a rather heroic way. He thought, and he was right, that stomach ulcers were caused by bacteria. But nobody believed him, because the idea that stomach ulcers were caused by stress and diet was too um, dominant. So he drank a solution of the bacteria. Now this is an awful 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 idea um, because it's so so dangerous and he had no idea what was going to happen but he was so convinced that he was right and nobody would believe him he drank a solution of this bacteria 
how he got sick. Um, he waited a while and discovered he had a stomach ulcer and then cured it with antibiotics. And these days, stomach ulcers are quite easy to cure with antibiotics, whereas previously, people had to live with the horrific pain of having an open bleeding sore in their stomach. Uh, the bacteria, hylobacteria, um, is going to be spread the normal way stomach bugs are spread, generally by pools of sick. Stomach ulcers are large open sores um, in your stomach, so you're going to be vomiting generally vomiting blood it is going to be very painful there's going to be um, blood in your poo as well and it is going to be very very painful the damage these days is very little Ebola is a virus it is going to be spread by bodily fluids So, um, vomit, um, blood, stuff like that. It is going to lead to diarrhoea, vomiting, rash, pain, and then your liver and your kidneys are going to stop working. It is very unpleasant and highly contagious. Chlamydia is a bacteria. It is spread via unprotected sex. It is one of the most common sexually transmitted infections in the UK. About 200,000 people are tested positive for chlamydia in England each year and 70% of those are under 25. The implications are going to be pain when urinating, a disgusting, skanky, horrible, smelly discharge that is going to come from the penis, the anus or the vagina. Bleeding in between periods. Or swollen testicles. The damage can be long term. It can lead to infertility. So the best thing to do is just wear a condom. HIV is a virus. It can be spread in a number of ways. That is unprotected sex. Um, sharing needles childbirth that's from mother to child not just general childbirth um, infected blood um, breastfeeding from an infected mother The implications are devastating for someone, although um, outcomes have rapidly improved recently due to the development of new drugs. So HIV attacks the white blood cells. White blood cells are an important part of your immune response. So if your white blood cells are being attacked, then you have little immune response. The damage is widespread and HIV can develop into AIDS, where um, you is, that's acquired immune deficiency response which can lead to even the smallest infection having devastating consequences because you have no immunity against it. Malaria is a parasite. It is spread by female mosquitoes. Drinking your blood 
at night. It's not quite as sexy as Twilight made it out to be. The implications are going to be a high fever, sweats, and also chills, headache, vomiting, uh, chest and muscle pains, and diarrhea. And this can be lethal in severe cases. Plant diseases can be identified in a number of different ways. This could be due to discoloration of the leaves. So here we have the tobacco mosaic virus where you can see the leaves going coloured or um, they could be a black colour developing as in rose black spots. The leaves could fall off. Um, it could have a loss of vigour basically means it falls over and looks a bit pathetic. Um, the flowers um, could either develop wrong or they could not develop at all, or it could die. However, a poorly looking plant doesn't necessarily have a disease, it might have an iron deficiency. If it has low nitrates, it is going to have poor growth plus yellow leaves. If there are low phosphates, it is going to have poor root growth, plus discoloured leaves. Low potassium is going to lead to poor flower and fruit growth and low magnesium is going to be yellow leaves. This cross over into chemistry, this is why your NPK fertilizers are important. The body is rather good at protecting itself against pathogens. The stomach is full of acid which kills bacteria. Your respiratory system, your nose, your trachea, your bronchi are full of mucus and hairs which trap bacteria. Your skin acts as a barrier which stops things getting in. And your eyes have tears which wash them out clean. Your immune system is brilliantly clever at protecting you. It consumes pathogens, so your white blood cells will engulf, they will eat anything that they see as unfamiliar and dangerous, and then it will destroy it. They produce antitoxins to counteract the toxins that the bacteria produce. And they produce antibodies so that they can recognise um, pathogens faster. I imagine most of you have been vaccinated or if you haven't at least you've heard about vaccinations. Vaccinations are given generally to children or people that have gone holiday to different places and the childhood vaccination program in the UK has prevented millions and millions of deaths and further millions and millions of serious illnesses and in this country it has wiped out a large number of debilitating diseases. It is very rare to hear anyone getting polio these days in the UK because we are all vaccinated against it at a young age. The polio vaccine isn't too bad because they give it to you on a sugar cube but it is quite painful taking your eight week old baby to be injected by the nurse. A vaccination is going to contain small amounts of dead or inactive pathogens. This allows your immune system to develop antibodies. So if you get infected with the disease at a later point, 
your body already has antibodies to it, it can recognise it, it knows its pathogen, it knows how to deal with it, and it can be dealt with quickly before you get ill. The advantages are that a large number of diseases have been wiped out, for example, nobody gets smallpox anymore, or polio. And we have herd immunity, which means if a large percentage of the population are vaccinated against disease, even the small percentage that have decided to not be vaccinated or can't be vaccinated for medical reasons are going to be protected as well because the disease will find it very hard to spread. The disadvantages is that they don't always work. The polio um, vaccines, smallpox vaccines, are very, very efficient, but things like the flu vaccine doesn't always work. And it can be painful... And there can be side effects. You may have heard about um, a controversy where somebody linked the MMR vaccine and autism. This is completely untrue. There is absolutely no link between these two. Because bacteria divide so quickly, in good conditions, they can divide once every 20 minutes they are going to be very, very susceptible to mutations in their DNA. Completely random changes, which means completely randomly, one tiny bacteria could develop a resistance to an antibiotic. And it only needs one bacteria out of a large collection to become resistant to the antibiotic for it to become a problem. Here we can see an antibiotic sensitivity test. These are the discs with antibiotics on it, and you can see the bacteria is growing all the way up to these discs, but not all the way up to this disc here. So the role of antibiotics is to kill bacteria. Because the bacteria divide so quickly, mutations can quickly develop. If to the course of any antibiotics, any non-resistant bacteria will be killed off. And any resistant bacteria will survive and grow. This is natural selection in action and soon only the resistant bacteria will be left. This is a problem because we are running out of antibiotics to treat um, common complications with. For example, um, tonsillitis um, is easily treated these days. Small infections are easily treated these days, whereas previously they might have been lethal. We use antibiotics far too much. They are given to animals um, daily, habitually in their feed. And this is driving the natural selection, driving the bacteria to mutate. If you want to produce an uncontaminated culture of bacteria, moving your bacteria from one place to another, you first need to flame your inoculation loop so that it is red hot. This makes sure it kills everything that is on there. You need to make sure that you open your bottles near the flame so that no further contamination can get in there. Open the lid as little as possible, flaming the lid as you go. Work as quickly as possible to transfer the sample of bacteria that you've picked up into your uncontaminated broth. I'm working as quickly as possible so that you don't get any other bacterial contamination. You can then leave the sample at um, 37 degrees if you've got an incubator or just leave it on the bench at 25 degrees um, for a few days and your bacteria will grow. I've done a much longer video explaining this, as you can see in set here, if you want to go and have a look at that, it's in the playlist with all of the other required practicals. When we are going to be looking at the effect of antibiotics or antiseptics on how bacteria grow, we need to make sure that our work area and our hands are clean. Because even though these um, bacteria are relatively safe to use, we have to assume they're going to be pathogenic. You need to make sure you've labelled the underside, not the lid, of the agar plate. And these plates will probably already be seeded for you by the technician. You can put your little filter paper discs on there, use forceps to do this, and then incubate them at 25 degrees for 48 hours. 
we can then we can then measure the clear zones in two different directions. Here the clear zone is slightly hard to see, but hopefully if you look close enough you can see it. It's better if you measure the diameter, but in this case the only thing that I could do was to measure the radius because the clear zone was so large. New drugs need to be tested for new things. Toxicity. Efficacy and dose. Toxicity tells us the level or the amount of the drug that we can take before the side effects are too bad. All the drugs that we take on a daily basis have side effects, but since we know how toxic they are, we know which safe or reasonable level we can take them at without suffering too badly from the side effects. Efficacy is like how efficient it is. You can see the similarities in the two words. Does it work better or worse than what's already on the market? Are the side effects better or worse than what's already on the market? Is it worth developing or taking this drug? And dose. How much do you need to take for the drug to be effective? Here we have our lovely little mouse who's going to be vaccinated and this is what's going to start the formation of antibodies. After a while, cells from the spleen of the mouse, where the antibodies are formed, are collected. We can take a known cell line, a cancerous cell line, bloma cells, and we can fuse them together. After the antibodies and the cancer cell line have been fused together, we end up with a hybrid cell. These hybrid cells can be grown in culture in a laboratory until we have lots and lots of them. After they've grown up, the cells can be taken and the cells and the antibodies can be separated. The antibodies can then be used for various different things like pregnancy tests or cancer detection. Epidemiology studies are going to be looking at the levels of health and illness in a population. We need to do it in a wide population. So we can look for different risk factors. For example, we can't force people, we can't ask people to eat a high fat diet or to do lots of exercise or to drink lots so we can compare them to other people who don't do those things or do do those things. But there are people within a wide population that do do those things already. So if we wanted to look at the effect of exercise on health, we could take our population, we could look at people that do lots of exercise and compare them to people that didn't do any exercise. And because we have such a large population of people we're looking at, then we can compare the two groups. And we can follow these groups for years and years to see what the effects are going to be. When we have cardiovascular disease, we have fatty deposits. building up in the coronary arteries, the arteries around the heart. This can lead to the formation of blood clots. This blood clot can block an artery. This is going to restrict the oxygen. To some cells. These cells are then going to die. If too many cells die, this can then lead to a heart attack. If so many cells die that the heart can't function properly or can't pump blood properly. Risk factors for this are going to be smoking, high blood pressure, or 
or having too much salt or fat in your diet. Your BMI is your body mass index. That is your mass divided by your height squared. We will use your BMI to work out whether you're underweight, a healthy weight, overweight, obese or severely obese. If you are obese or severely obese, you are increasing your risk of type 2 diabetes, heart disease, some cancers and stroke. As part of a lifestyle, some people may choose to drink alcohol or to smoke. However, if you drink alcohol, you are susceptible to liver damage. You are at increased risk of some cancers. Alcohol has a lot of calories in it, so you are at risk of being overweight. Smoking can lead to lung damage. And cancer.